Tim Decay is, as you heard, a graduate of Lemoyne College, class of 1985. He's achieved celebrity in a field, the entertainment industry, that is incredibly competitive and replete with stories of remarkably talented performers who have toiled for years to be a star but failed to realize success. Mr. Decay is the exception. Grounded in the tenets of the Jesuit education he received here at Lemoyne, Tim's steady rise in the industry has taken him, as you just heard in Professor Morris's reading of his citation, to the pinnacle of his profession. He is a much sought after comedic and dramatic actor, and his talents are showcased perfectly in his current role as FBI agent Peter Burke, a no-nonsense federal agent in the USA Network's hit series, White Collar. At a time when much of what fills the airwaves is not very well done, White Collar is a critically acclaimed success. Tim, in his lead role, is part of a smart, well-acted show that combines suspense, humor, and intrigue with moral lessons around basic values as displayed through his portrayal of Agent Burke. As described on the show's website, Peter Burke, quote, believes in earning success the old-fashioned way with perseverance and hard work. As Dolphin, Tim knows that our absolute favorite episode is titled Bottleneck. That episode aired on February 23rd. In one of the scenes, Agent Burke was seen sitting at a kitchen table, sipping from a long neck while wearing a Lemoyne College t-shirt. Millions of viewers saw the Lemoyne named proudly worn on the show by our famous alum. Graduates, I now ask you, by a show of applause, who would encourage Mr. Decay to do the same in the next season? Since becoming president, I have had the pleasure of getting to know Tim. He is an exceptional representative of Lemoyne. He is hardworking, personable, ethical, talented, genuine, down to earth, and dedicated to our college. We have shared a couple of lunches together in Los Angeles, and each time, Tim said to me that the best four years of his life were those years here at Lemoyne. It is now my privilege to introduce our friend and advocate, Mr. Tim Decay. Thank you, President Pastello, and thank you, Bill Morris. I am deeply humbled and grateful to be sharing this profound and amazing day with the honored faculty, the parents, grandparents, family, and friends of the class of 2010. Hello, graduating class of 2010. This is quite profound. This is a moment. What you have accomplished, this is inspiration. There is no need to hold your breath now. You are here. You have written all your papers, taken all your finals, from your freshman year, seeing all those strangers who came from different schools in different states, to the end of this senior year, where those same strangers from different schools in different states are now your closest friends, you have arrived. You did it. It was 25 years ago that I graduated from Lemoyne College. I was feeling many, many things, one of which was pride, and I hope each of you in your own way is feeling that. You deserve to feel that. I was feeling sentimental, and I hope each of you in your own way is feeling that. You deserve to feel that. I was feeling hungover, and I hope each of you in your own way is feeling that. You deserve to feel that.
I am a storyteller. That is what I do for a living. I am an actor who has dedicated nearly his entire professional life to telling the story of the human condition in its tragic, comic, and endlessly fascinating forms. Is that what I thought I would be when I first came to Lemoyne? No. I was going to be a pro baseball player. I thought I would play baseball, get a great, great education, and a business degree. Then I'd go play in the big leagues for the Red Sox or the Yankees. Didn't matter. This Protestant went to live out his dream up on the heights. Now, I believe I was fortunate to get in. I think they were short on Protestants that year. I can just see them in the admissions office. C for Catholic. C, C, a P. Oh, we've got a P here. How many P's do we have so far? Two. Oh, we need more than that. His name is Decay. That sounds kind of Irish. And we're meeting our quota. I'm not going to look at his grades. He's in. I experienced the best four years of my life up on the heights. I coach my kids in Little League, and we catch a Dodger game now and then, but that's about the closest I get to a playing field. Lemoyne's education, however, is what will always keep us in the big leagues. As I said, I am a storyteller, so that is what I give to you today. Some stories and some words that I think I would have wanted to hear on my graduation. I would imagine that many of you are uncertain about what will happen in the next few weeks, months, and perhaps even years. That uneasiness comes with these lines of demarcation, these graduations we have throughout life. You may know what you want to do once the diploma has been handed to you, but you're not entirely sure of how it will all work out. Some of you may not have a clear idea of what you want to do. That's all right. What this school has given you is immeasurable. You have learned how to learn. In May of 1985, I had an idea of what was going to transpire in the month following gradu graduation. I was fortunate. I had a job. My mom and I went to Learberry's and we bought two suits, a gray flannel and a blue pinstripe. I put on those suits and I thought, oh yeah, I am prepared. <laughs> we also bought four ties to mix and match with those suits. In addition, I had a briefcase because there were going to be some really important documents that I would need to take home with me each night. I was about to live the dream. I secured a job at Comdoc. It was a company that sold Rico copiers. I knew I was going to make millions. I was going to have big power meetings in dark offices that had subtle lighting. I was going to be the next Gordon Gecko. On my first day of work, I sat proudly at my desk wearing the gray flannel. A huge binder with pamphlets, brochures, and an exorbitant amount of information on how Rico copiers performed had landed on my desk. It was immediately clear that the binder would not fit in my briefcase. I had two weeks to learn the material. I thought to myself, okay, no power lunch today, maybe something later on in the week, maybe not, that's okay, I'm going to be successful. Besides, there was something else occupying my time that would be a welcome diversion. I decided to do a play for a local community theater. I had acted here at the Firehouse, then Lemoyne's main stage, and enjoyed it. And after all, I still had my briefcase. After a few weeks of learning about copiers, I started to cold call. I had to randomly select businesses in the greater Syracuse area, make a phone call, or knock on the door of that business and ask if their copiers were fulfilling all of their office needs. I made a lot of those code calls, and two months later, my pitch was, oh Lord, get me out of here. I had not sold one copier. There seemed to be people all around me who were walking in with sales slips and giving high fives to the manager. I observed the most successful sales rep and noticed Alan in particular. He was wearing an interesting and very, very proud and confident way about him. He was an interesting individual and he was intelligent and he had a keen business sense. He had a passion for copiers. 
It was strong within him. I watched him in action and decided I would emulate him in all of my meetings. I did that for the next month. It didn't work. I learned something. I learned that I couldn't sell a copier to save my life. I applaud those who, who can. I do. What could I sell? Where could I work? I was not living the dream. My next interview was at Marcellus Casket Company. Wait. I walked in with my Learberry suit, the pinstripe this time, and met a gentleman named Bob Graves. That's right. I, Tim Decay, was being interviewed by Bob Graves at Marcellus Casket Company. Yeah, that's rich. My writer friends in Los Angeles could not come up with that. If they pitched that in a room at Warner Brothers, the executive would say, that's too ridiculous. Regardless, it happened and it went well. They liked the ideas I had for national distribution and warehousing. I enjoyed my work at Marcellus and learned a lot from the pr people that I worked with. They even came to see some of my plays. I kept doing plays. I made no money in community theater, but I loved doing it. Whenever I had a free moment, I was at the theater. It had become my life, my passion. It hit me hard. I could not deny it. It was strong within me. Since it was my life, could I make it my livelihood? That's a big difference. I called my parents and told them of my revelation. There was silence on the other end, and I quickly explained I was thinking of going to graduate school for acting. They seemed to feel a bit relieved knowing I could always teach. Now, I am not telling all of you to quit your day job, find yourself, and become an actor. I hope what you have chosen does fulfill you. And if you haven't made that choice, I hope you find something that leads you to fulfillment. There are moments when I am in a rehearsal and all the synapses are working. The blood is flowing. Everyone is in perfect communication. And it's so invigorating that it's religious. That is what we all work towards. Teachers have those moments in the classrooms. Surgeons have them in operating rooms. Lawyers have them in the courtroom. And copier salesmen have them when they are on their game. It's for everybody who is so impassioned and entrenched with their work and the work of the people around them that they realize this is it. This is where I belong. It's what I do and I do it well. Sacrifice and bliss, they go together. Listen to what calls you. You certainly listened well four years ago when you decided to come to Le Moyne. Keep listening. And here's the other thing. Unfortunately, you also have to fail. Before she discovered the gifted boarding school student named Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling had experienced many failures in her life. She said, failure can only strip away the layers of inessential. That is a good reason to pursue what is strongest within us. Marianne Williamson wrote, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. That is a good reason to pursue what is strongest within us. I'm not going to tell you that failure is great fun, but it is extremely valuable and it is inevitable. The irony is that we should avoid failure whenever we can, but we all experience it. And when we do, we can learn something significant from it. My wish for you is that when you fail, you will look at it as losing a layer of inessential. It will begin to empower you beyond measure. Now sometimes it seems as if technology is keeping us apart. Our headphones, iPods, iPhones, iPads, Twitters, texting, Facebook, and the ever-present TV screen often keep us isolated. Although you can be isolated Tuesday nights while watching White Collar on the USA Network from 9 to 10. Lots of children are hooked up to a game instead of being outside with their friends after school. 
I walk into a Williams Sonoma or a Sur La Table or any other fancy home cooking stores, and I see walls of coffee, cappuccino, espresso, latte, mocha, frappe machines. Huge walls. A person can make an amazing frothy wathy frappa mocha latte in the confines of their five bedroom, four bathroom McMansion. And yet, we head for the local coffee shop and it is packed. Why? We long to be a part of something. We want to be connected in person. We long to break bread or drink sugar-filled coffee where we can see other people, hear them, exchange ideas with them. We long to get together. I know there is a huge debate about the advantages and disadvantages of our technology, and I do not admit that I am without them. I admit that being able to video conference my family in L.A. while I shoot in New York keeps me sane. Nevertheless, there is a need for something that our top technology does not provide, something that you have had here. It has taken me some time to realize what it is. I'm not talking about the romantic interests or the classes, but about something else. It might be as simple as how I felt when I walked to class, or the number of people who said hi, or that quiet time in the quad right after dinner and just before we hit the books. It might be a late night study group or just the feeling I got when I walked into the firehouse. For four years, I lived in a dorm in close contact with people. If ever I had a problem or needed something, I had the privilege of being able to knock on someone's door. It is about community. That is what you have had here. You have been a part of something incredibly special, a close-knit group. Undoubtedly, today someone will slap you on the back and remind you that you are on your own. You are, in a sense. Perhaps you long for solitude. You may welcome it. One of the things you may be looking forward to most is getting a place of your own. That's exciting. I know I didn't want to live in Nelligan Hall any longer, although that is the best hall at the school. But when I had been away from Le Moyne, I missed it. I missed the sense of community. Once someone from another school, actually one just down the road that was beaten by the Le Moyne basketball team this year, <laughs> told me that Le Moyne seemed like a bubble to him. At the time, I gave the argument about how we are a private institution with greater teacher to student ratio and that we have Jesuits living in the dorms. I have come to know exactly what he meant, however, and I'm not the only one who knows the secret. Just a few days ago, I had the honor of seeing an old teacher and friend, Father McShane, now the president of Fordham University. We were filming on his campus, and we were talking about the old days at Le Moyne. Father McShane was a wonderful presence on campus. He taught me in a class titled Currents in Contemporary Catholicism. He said, there is a secret at Le Moyne. It's the community up there. It's a very special place. Any of the Jesuits who taught there would be happy to go back. I try to go back at least once a year. Now, I'm fortunate that one of the communities now I am part of is filled with actors. I was shooting a movie in Bulgaria. I decided to go to a play. I knew it would be in Bulgarian, but that didn't matter. There was a film student, Pavel, working on the set for school credit, and he offered to go to the play with me and help me with some of the translating. His English was not bad, and I knew he wanted to see the play. So I thought that would be great. We sat down. It was a beautiful old theater. How it survived the war, I'll never know. The lights dimmed, and the play began. Pavel looked a little nervous. He turned to me and said in his broken English, uh, I am sorry, Tim. This is a touring company from Italy. I don't know Italian. <laughs> it didn't matter. It was a farce. Funny behavior is funny behavior in any language. Afterwards, I went backstage. I was in the dressing rooms that felt so familiar to me. I was talking about acting with Italians and other Bulgarian actors who came to see the show. And somehow we all communicated. I was in one of my communities. 
Now the nice thing is that although we leave this wonderful world up in the heights, we have the opportunity to create new communities. The cliche is that the world is waiting, but if you think of it as communities are waiting, I think it feels nicer. I don't know what these new communities will be, but I'm hopeful they'll be meaningful. You are the gifted and talented. You will discover your new communities where you work, where you live, where you pray, where your children go to school. What you do with them, how you engage with those in them, how you make them worthwhile is up to you. I leave it open, but I'll give you words that I hope are part of your communities. Storytelling, sharing, thinking globally and acting locally, dancing, laughing, sacrificing, being happy, changing, reaching out to other communities, caring, loving, and eating really good food. If these words are part of your community, you shouldn't hesitate if you need to knock on someone's door or hesitate to open one. We are in a time where participation is necessary. We can't sit out. We can rest, we can stop and observe, but we must participate in this world. Make no mistake that observing is participating, reflecting is participating. Finding the balance between reflection and action, that takes wisdom. I've often heard that if you greatly change the lives of two people in this world, you're doing well. Perhaps the one person is you, the other is whomever you choose. The theory is that when we greatly change that person's life, we will greatly change someone else's life and someone else's life and someone else's life. Something profound happened to me and my 10-year-old son recently after watching a movie. We had watched Blind Side. If you haven't seen it, it's the story of Michael Orr, a homeless and traumatized boy who became an all-American football player and a first-round NFL draft pick with the help of a caring woman and her loving family. Later on, I was tucking him in and his pillow was wet. Huge tears were coming down his face. You know the kind. They're big tears. When your crying just comes in spite of you. He wanted to know why there were moms and dads who truly didn't want to keep their kids. He asked what we could do about it. He wanted to adopt a bunch of kids so there weren't any kids without families. I went on to explain how there are organizations that help these kids as best they can. We talked about how, unfortunately, we can't adopt a whole bunch of kids and reminded him that our family and his school do a lot of charity work. He was not completely satisfied with this answer and responded, but if every family in the country like us, meaning fairly comfortable and safe, just adopted one kid, we wouldn't have this problem. Unfortunately, it's not that simple, but he had a point, and the point is to actively make a difference. All those thoughts are still working in his head. Now, our seven-year-old daughter skipped the wet pillow on this occasion. We had some friends over for brunch soon after, and it wasn't until halfway through the brunch we realized she went around with a, the house with an old Easter basket collecting funds for the Hillside Orphanage, which is in our community. She did somehow change a tiny piece of their world with her $47.21, and she received a letter acknowledging that. She cherishes that letter that says, you made a difference. Make a difference. At this time, I would like to share with you what words my family would like to impart to you today. From Dana, our seven-year-old daughter, we all make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. Just try not to do them again. <laughs> From Jameis, our 10-year-old son, live your life to the fullest. Don't let anybody change your mind. From my wife, Lisa, who is sitting right there today, life is a journey to be, life is a journey to be lived, not a destination to be reached. From my mom, who is also sitting right there, find what fulfills you most, the thing that tells you this is what I am meant to do. Do not settle for less. Then, developing all your capabilities, share your talent core. Along the way, help others find theirs. From my dad, in many ways this is just like graduating from grammar school. 
You've learned some great stuff. Now you're about to apply what you've learned and learn even more. From my brother Jamie, on a wondrous note, stare at the stars every once in a while to observe something really big and really old. You can decide whether it makes you feel small and isolated or powerful and connected. On a practical note from Jamie, don't forget to compare yourselves to people who have less than you, as well as to people who have more. Given the fact that you are graduating from an institution of higher education today, the vast majority of people on earth have far less than you. Enjoy the fact that you are educated and keep learning. A few months ago, a fax came through my office with a note from Father William Curran. Tim, the Syracuse Diocese archivist, was away until yesterday, but he did an immediate search on his return. So here is your request, Bill S.J. I have here a copy of the commencement exercises. Lemoyne College, June 10th, 1951. Our first commencement given by His Excellency Most Reverend Walter A. Forey, D.D. Bishop of Syracuse. Here are just a few things the bishop said that day. This address would fail to reveal to this class and to this audience my own personal feelings and convictions if I did not ask each graduate and each one of the Friends of Lemoyne an interest in this young college. Lemoyne has now begun. Its influence is at work. The alumni will not, I am sure, be unmindful of their alma mater. They know that the school must increase its facilities and they must grow to meet new needs. They, with all the friends at Lemoyne, will hurry the fulfillment of this happy dream. Along with the Bishop Forey, I charge you to continue to fill, fill this happy dream. Although we are rich in tradition, this school is relatively young. I sense it feels older because of the Jesuit education and that we are proud of the traditions we have made up on the heights. While here at school, you have made enormous contributions to communities both near and far from ours. We must all continue to make such contributions. Bill Esper, an eminent acting teacher of our time, has repeatedly told me and all of us who have studied under him to put all that you know, all your homework, all that you have created and accomplished and put it in your back pocket. Put all of that in your back pocket, hit the stage and be present. That's where you are. You're about to hit the stage. Put Lemoyne in your back pocket. Trust that it is there. It's a part of you. Be open and be present to what is in the business world, the research centers, the graduate work, the arts and our planet. You are charged with continuing to spread the name of Lemoyne College throughout this country and the world. As the pages of an history unfold, let its name be known to those in states and circles that do not normally hear of Lemoyne. Dolphins are the heights. You are the 60th graduating class. You're lucky. I wish you all happiness, courage, great failure, great success, loving communities, grace, and Godspeed. Thank you.